Hello, I'm Phil Croshaw. About a year ago, during another lockdown, I made a decision. I was always interested in people's passions, where they came from, why they meant so much to them, and how people managed, in some cases, to make a living or career from them. There was really only one thing to do at this point, and that was to research it. So I had a conversation with my good mate, Spencer Phillips, and he agreed it was an intriguing question. So we decided to turn the talk into action and created our Passions Project, a video and podcast channel that set out to talk to people about, yes, you guessed it, their passions. So here we are about 10 months later, having managed to interview over 65 people about their passions just so far. And as I speak, we're on a summer holiday break before cracking on with our next stage of the journey in autumn. So we thought this would be a good time just to take a breather and reflect on our work so far and share with you some snippets from our interviews. In this first montage, we focus on the passion that is motorsport. We welcome some great people who share their insights, stories and perspectives related to their passion for motorsport. So that's it in this introduction, short and sweet, just like me. Enjoy. Hello again, and a very warm welcome to Passions. And in this episode, I'm so delighted to be joined by Sam Smith. No, not the singer, which I'm sure he gets a quite a bit. Sam Smith from Motorsport. So Sam, great, very warm welcome to Passions. Tell us who you are and what your passion is. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you for having me. It's great to be on the show. Um, well, I suppose my passion, I'm lucky, my passion is my profession. So motorsport has always been in the blood since I was a little kid, mainly through my father who uh, competed in rallying at a sort of national level back in the 60s with minis and so forth. So yeah, it's always been there. Uh, I've worked in it for really 30 years. I started very young when I was 14 as a work experience kid with a professional team, which is, you know, a whole different, a whole different uh, strata of stories and, and scrapes and anecdotes there for you. But <laughs> Yeah, I suppose after university, I, I, I worked with championships and constructors and manufacturers and a few teams. And then in 2012, I became freelance and sort of pursued my passion, which is writing uh, and journalism. And about the same time, it just so happened that there was a little there's a little old new championship called Formula E, which came on the block with all electric powertrains, which was very interesting, very relevant. Uh, and I worked in that as a journalist ever since for various uh, publications and uh, to the point where I've now written a book about Formula E, which uh, came out last month and has been well received and is a kind of history, sporting, technically, um, politically, if you like, about Formula E and, and how it's grown to be this great championship. But yeah, predominant passion is motorsport in all its guises, really. Um, but in particular, what's what's now and relevant and, um, and, and interesting, which certainly is Formula E. The seamless um, acceleration of those cars, to me, is just as appealing as um, as your ice engine cars as well. So I think there's there's a lot of misnomers. There was a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of sort of wrong opinions and wrong, I would guess, um, just perceptions in and around all electric vehicles that actually something like Formula E can help diminish and and I think they have done so the the noise thing is a classic right so you know it can't be motor racing because it's not noisy well you know that is I mean honestly I can only speak for myself I love I love Porsche 917s I love Formula One the the sort of 70s and 80s the history of sport just as much as the next person but it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference uh, when you're at the track in fact having been to 17 Le Mans Phil, I can tell you that the lack of noise is a is a respite that that my ears need as as much as anyone. So it's always fascinated me actually 
how short-sighted a lot of people in in motorsport can be when you know racing is all about tomorrow it's all about the future um so if you can't embrace what i would call peripheral things such as noise and and so forth then um you know i don't really get that because people forget that in the 80s when the great turbo era of your senators your mansells your pks and your keke rosbergs was you know the full fat formula one of the 80s the turbos didn't make a noise they made a sort of whizzing and popping noise and that was it and actually sounded you know pretty pathetic compared to a, an atmospheric car so you know that that doesn't hold <laughs> much much water that argument about about the noise in my opinion yeah it's, it's very interesting but i remember when um when they changed the rules on formula one it went from the screeching noisy cars that were part of the experience and there was all sorts of big comments about oh they don't sound the same da, 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 da. do you think there's a part of it is that the dare i say it that the uh, the people I suppose in charge of motorsport at the higher end are going to be generally i guess older um perhaps you know still stuck a little bit in their ways because we see it a lot don't we in many different in many different areas that older people it's like oh it wasn't like that in my day <laughs> that's i say it myself now which is a bit scary um do you think there's a lot of that is just that, that and, and maybe they don't even really understand it in the same way yeah it's a good point i mean if you do look at who has governed and, and influenced formula one over the last 40 50 well yeah 40 years you know you've got bernie eccleston who you know in the 80s was i think almost you know in his 60s so and then you had this uh triumvirate of of uh, corporates um running it uh well ross braun you wouldn't call a corporate because ross braun is a is a a pure racer who's come up through the ranks through through williams uh arrows benetton and ferrari but the two liberty guys who came in um in the last sort of decade yeah that you know again they're in their 60s so but i think what they did which was clever was that they surrounded themselves by a lot of younger people and i think that has borne out through things like the netflix drive to survive project which has been <clears> extremely <throat> popular and, and has brought on new fans so yeah, yes, brilliant. What, i thought that was example. absolutely brilliant because in fact what it brought home to me is just how sterilized the the, the formula one experience had become and the minute you go behind the scenes and, you know, there's a real world, it's swearing, you know, and there's some cracking characters, isn't there? You know, the Haas yeah. team manager and people like that, uh, Steiner. I mean, they're just so entertaining. Um, but, and to hear the kickoffs and the, and the, and, and all that kind of thing behind the scenes, I think an authenticity mm. is where it's at. And I think Formula E will need to be thinking in the same way, I think. Well, I think I think you get that in in whatever competitive environment you, you're in, yeah. and Formula yeah. E is no different. Um, it's yeah. just making sure people see it and, and pitching it right. So, um, I think I think from Formula One's point of view, yeah, that that it's been a great move to try and bring the characters and and some of the you know the real people in the championship. Because if you go ultra corporate, you know you lose that. Everyone becomes a, a robot. Everybody comes the same they got the same opinions you know the press conferences are quite staid um you don't get the natural characters coming out and the drivers or the the team personnel as you said i think in formula e that that is there you know when i think about the people i speak to among the drivers and the teams um i see it day to day and there are some terrific characters and there are some tetchy characters there are some there are some people who have got you know all kinds of uh peccadilloes and, and characteristics which you'd find tricky you know on on the street or somebody just in another industry let alone in a high pressure environment as as formula e because let's not forget that unlike formula one racing formula e takes place in one day so practice qualifying and the race all happen in one day and the pressure that the teams and the drivers are under is is immense i mean you know when you get a driver like andre lotterer who has won three le mans and been a professional driver for the best part of 25 years and been very successful when he says to you he says to me that it's the hardest thing he's ever done is formula e and you think wow because i know how hard le mans is i know how hard formula one is i know how hard um you know even championships like indycar or super formula are but formula e is different because of that time uh, the concertina of time on a race day the amount of preparation you have to do in a simulator and then you know just the fact that if you make a mistake you can't recover it's like in formula one if you 
spare the car off into the wall in practice you know your mechanics will get the car ready for practice two or practice three in formula e if you shunt the car in free practice you know you might not even make the grid or if you make the grid you'll have penalties for you know, the, the car being changed um, i mean if you shunt in qualifying you've got probably two and a half hours to get the car ready for uh for the race so very di very difficult um there's still a lot of pressure from the manufacturers because the manufacturers are great they bring money they bring prestige but they also bring a, a great deal of pressure because you are representing a a company of you know 200 300,000 employees uh with a massive brand and reputation and history not only in motorsport but also in in automotive and, and and global um marketing as well so it's um it's a high pressure high stress environment and uh, you know that's why the that's why it's on the up and that's why the drivers get get paid well because th these big manufacturers um you know they demand the best and and the drivers have to perform it's that simple yeah i mean one, one of the things i've been quite staggered at is the progress technological progress in terms of um batteries i guess in the simplest way um there seems to have been is that is my perception right there is that one of the reasons why it's succeeding is because the battery power the battery technology is getting better and better so the power is getting better and better because i was amazed at the speeds that these electric cars get up to and i think there's a perception that when they're quieter they're not going as fast. And when I did the research, when I started to get interested in it, I was amazed at the speeds they were getting up to. Yeah, they're quick. I mean, let's be frank, they're not as quick as Formula One and, and they won't be for a very long time. I mean, they're, they're quite they're quite a bit slower than Formula One, but they're quick enough. You know, I would say they're in and around the pace of, of a Formula Three car, but that's not the issue. You know, you, you've got to put the speed into the environment. So... I would say 90% of Formula E tracks are street circuits. Yeah. And if, you, if you've ever been to a street circuit, you know, th there isn't the gravel traps. There's not the, the tarmac runoff. There's not the soft, <laughs> soft barriers. It, you know, if you go off, you're hitting a wall and you're hitting it hard. In terms of the, the technology, the, the interesting thing for me is the batteries, as, as you say. You know, the, the, the powertrain clusters they have are essentially um, a motor they're, they're now limited to a single motor uh, twin motors were used in the the first couple of seasons or the, sorry the second third fourth and fifth season of, of formulary e. now it's just a single motor um, then you've got your inverter package and a gearbox uh, and that bolts onto the the battery essentially now the formula e is quite heavy so the performance of formula e cars is dictated ultimately by how heavy the car is and, and these are these are heavy cars you know they're, they're significantly uh, heavy i'm just trying to think of the numbers they're probably around um probably around 250 to 300 kilograms heavier than a than a formula one car hello and a very warm welcome to this edition of passions and today i'm quite excited actually because i'm going to be talking to julia fry from extreme e so if you're wondering now what extreme e is about you're soon going to find out so a very warm welcome to passions julia tell us who you are what you do and what your passion is Hi, Phil. Um, very nice to, to be joining you today. Um, yeah, my name is Julia Fry. I'm the head of communications for Extreme E, and I'll tell you exactly what that is as we go through this. Um, but essentially, it's electric racing. Uh, it's one of the, well, I think it's the newest motorsport going. Um, it's about racing in remote environments in places affected by climate change so that we can essentially use sport for purpose and uh, helping to move towards clean energy, transport, mobility, all ways of life um, that help have a lower impact on the planet. And if we can help combat climate change. So uh, let's just talk a little bit now about then Extreme E. Uh, obviously, as I was saying before we came on, I get, get quite, got quite excited about it because I watched the race, uh, uh, the last race in, was it Senegal? I think it was. Senegal, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just, I was just hooked right from the right from the word go. So tell me how you got involved in Extreme E. And then for those people that don't really know what the heck we're talking about, what exactly is Extreme E? Um, well, I think I was super lucky and I think it was all about the right time and, and sometimes things work out just when they should. Um, I was working at the Clip Around the World Yacht Race previous to this for six odd years um, and realised that it was time to do something new. Um, it was the right timing. And it, it, at exactly the same time I was thinking about that, I saw this opportunity on LinkedIn 
for something called Extreme, uh, which I hadn't really th- heard of before then. I think it had launched like the month before. So I had to, to give it a little look up. And as soon as I read about it, I mean, it just ticked every single box for me. It was about racing in remote environments, places that I'd never been to when, it, you know, we're going to the ice, ice cap in Greenland next uh, month, um, which, you know, you just don't normally get the chance to go places like that. Um, I've traveled a lot in sports, so it's it's hard to find some places that I haven't really been so far. Um, but then it also had this this purpose driven aspect to it, which is is built into the very sort of fiber of its creation, which is about using sport for purpose. And in this sense, it's about raising awareness and hoping to you know create action. Um, you know, the transport sector contributes to about thirty percent of global emissions, and that is huge. And we are at the beginning of probably the biggest shift in transport that we've ever um, heard of since wheels and motors were invented uh, we're heading into electrification and I think we we're now understanding as a as a planet you know the, the sense of um, uh, action and uh, consequence and you know we, we need to move towards clean mobility um, in order to you know slow down what's happening to our planet if we, if we want a good future um, so I just it gripped me Im- immediately um, what was also quite nice where it's a new sport and nobody had heard of it um you know the passion that i felt from those that were already running it on the inside so you know alejandro gag ali russell who's our um you know he's our he's our engine our powerhouse who drives it all from the inside the way they spoke about it even though i had never heard about extremely before i knew that it was going to go somewhere and that these guys had ambition um so yeah it ticked every box and over the last two, two and a half years, we've been able to build a sport from an absolute blank slate, create our own sporting format, um, which is terribly exciting, um, launch it, bring it to, to the fans. And it seems to be going well. And it's so, so gratifying when we hear people like you who are obviously sports fans, you're into your motorsport, to say that you're watching it, you're enjoying it, because that is a huge sense of sort of achievement. And that's, you know, very satisfying. Yeah. And of course, it must be... Um from a PR point of a communications point of view, it must help no end the fact that you've got names like Lewis Hamilton involved and Nico Rosberg and Jensen Button. So real names from your point of view in terms of getting people's attention, which we all know what it's about in PR, getting people's attention in the first place and engagement, uh, having those sorts of people involved must be quite uh, helpful. Um, massively helpful, yes. I mean, when I first had that chat yeah. with Ali um, before, you know, it only just launched, he mentioned names like, you know, we're going to have the biggest names in this sport. And I kind of, I, I believed him because you, when you speak to Ali, everything he says is believable because it's done with such passion. Um, but to actually pull that off and be part of the inside story of how we did that. I mean, the, the guys running Extreme have endless passion, ambition. And to have, yeah, Lewis Hamilton, Jensen Button, Nico Rosberg, Carlos Sainz, Sebastian Loeb, we've just signed McLaren. I mean, for a series to do that before we even went racing um, was just incredible. Um, but I think it's a sign of the times. I think people know that we're heading towards a new sort of future, a new um, way of doing motorsport. And, and Alejandro Gag has tapped into, you know, how to make this mainstream exciting, kind of reinvent sporting formats that have been around for years and years and actually bring a whole new sort of lens to them. I think our goal with Extreme E was to just do things differently, break boundaries. Um, it was obviously started with Formula E, which I think took the industry by storm. Um, but this is going a step further and we're you know, really getting out into places where you can see climate change happening. And I think people care. I think people, when they're faced with it and understand the facts, they do care. We are all in this together. Um, but it's certainly helpful from a communications point of view when you have the big names of people that uh, you really look up to in the sport, whether you like electrification uh, on board with that idea or not, you're on board with those sort of heroes of the sport. And when they sort of evangelize that message for you, it's incredibly powerful. Hello, I'm Phil Croshaw and a very warm welcome to Passions. And today I am really delighted to be joined uh, as my guest, a gentleman by the name of Mark Preston. And do you know what? I'm going to let Mark introduce himself because uh, he's got quite an amazing story and quite an amazing background. So, Mark, very warm welcome. Tell us who you are and what you're about. Yeah, how, uh, thanks for inviting me on the show today, Phil. Um, yeah, well, I'm originally from Australia. I came over here to the UK where I live now about 20 years ago or so 
to work in Formula One. Um, I started life as an engineer. I suppose I still am an engineer. I studied mechanical engineering. Um, I worked for General Motors in Australia. I started doing my own racing cars in Formula Fords, actually, all those years ago. Um, and uh, we built our own Formula Fords and, and um, had our own teams in, in Australia. But then at one point, I decided I needed to know more about racing cars. And I thought, you know, the place to come is, is um, England. So I gave myself um, two weeks or two years, actually, when I was 27, because Australians are allowed to come over to the UK and work, work um, uh, when, they're, when they're younger. So I came over here for two weeks or two years and got a job with TWR or Arrows Grand Prix. And I started work here as a stress engineer, which means working how, how strong things are. So I come from the very much um, calculations, theoretical um, background. I got involved really early on in Formula Electric and still am involved. I was one of the founding team principals when Alejandro Agag started Formula E. And currently, I am the team principal of the Tachita Formula E team, which has won the last two drivers, oh, sorry, three drivers and two teams oh. championships with DS Automobiles. So I'm a racer, have been racing all my life and um, yeah, just love cars and, and the whole world around cars and, and uh, motorsports. I absolutely love it. And, and as I said before we came on air, um, I have to admit that there's some people that you interview that perhaps resonate with you a little bit more. And being a big Formula One fan as I am, uh, I am a little bit... Uh, starstruck at this point mark i'm sorry to embarrass you but i am a little bit in comparison with normal um okay so uh, in terms of the passion then what well first question is what would you what would you say your passion actually is if you had to summarize it in a very short sentence can you d describe what exactly the passion is in you that drives you around down this route i suppose i do enjoy the competition which is one you know big thing in motorsports I enjoy doing things that nobody else has ever done, and that's um, really a big challenge. So challenges where nobody can give you the answers, where the the answer is not known, and so it provides more of a challenge to me than, um, than one where maybe someone knows how it's done. And Formula One is definitely on that scale, and now definitely in, um, in uh, Formula E. When I first started Formula E, I remember someone saying, I said, oh, how does this work? And they said, well, we don't know yet because nobody's done an electric race car. So, you know, that's the kind of place I enjoy being. And, and actually, I have another startup company which does autonomous cars and that's called Street Drone. And that's very, very similar. It's things that nobody knows how to solve. That's the place I like to be. Fantastic. So I suppose, is it fair to say that you are living proof of somebody that's actually made a career out of that passion? Because they do say, don't they? I tend to agree with it that if you can make a, a decent living or a good living or a very good living out of your passion, then there's a very good chance you won't work for another another day in your life. Would you say that's true of your, your own journey? 100%. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we travel quite a lot in, in motorsports, um, certainly Formula One more than Formula E. When we ran the last uh, six races of the championship this year, we're in Berlin um, in a sort of a semi-lockdown um, mode for two weeks in the same hotel um, going back and forth to the track but still uh, it's racing and you enjoy racing so yeah I I don't have trouble um, and maybe this is not a good thing but don't have trouble working <laughs> at night or on the weekends or um, often sadly public public uh, holidays go past and I don't notice and so all right that's that's probably I mean some people don't like that way of thinking <laughs> but um yeah, I, I, I'm always thinking about racing, and therefore it's um, it's just easy. You, you get me um, get me somewhere, and I'll talk about racing cars for all night if you want me to. Often, I, a lot of young engineers ask me, you know, what advice can I give them, and what you know, where should they focus? And often, I I grab their CV, and and obviously, as a as a young engineer, you maybe don't have that much on your CV yet, and I usually look at things like. Um, What's their extracurricular activities? What thesis did they do at university? Um, what sort of things have they written about or got involved in? And then you know use that as a judgment and say, well, it looks like here on your CV you're really into maths or working outside or talking to people or such and such. And say, look, I would focus if I was you on the thing you enjoy the most because you're probably the best at that. 
because I often, if they don't know the answer to that question, sometimes I say, well, which subject did you get the best marks for? Because maybe that gives a hint towards the thing you enjoyed the most. So, for example, I was best at university at, um, they think what they call stress analysis, which is um, mathematics and, and to do with solving problems using mathematics. And actually, that's what I ended up mostly focusing on. And that's probably why I enjoy so much um, the parts of racing that I get you know, more involved in, which is to do with simulation, um, mathematics, figuring out how to make the car go faster, and very similar to what I'm doing with autonomous vehicles, because that's a lot of maths, a lot of problem solving. So yeah, I, I, I do look at someone's CV and say, show me which things you're interested in, and maybe I'd point you towards the, the things that look like they're highlighted on your CV. So that's, that's certainly something I, I really focus on. Hello, Phil Croshaw here again from Passions. And in this episode, we're back motor racing, but this time with the ladies. Hello and a very warm welcome to this episode of Passions. And today uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Joanne Diamond. And Jo has got all sorts of various different things she's, she's up to. And I'm going to let her introduce herself because she'll do a lot better job than me. Uh, but she's going to talk today about motor racing and about opportunities for women and uh, all sorts of various different things and uh, obviously her passions. So, Joe, very warm welcome to this episode of Passions. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what your passion is. Thank you, Phil. Pleasure to be here today. Um, so, yes, I have many, many, many passions and um, I'm very fortunate to be able to be working in, in something that I am extremely passionate about, which is obviously motorsport. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about sport in general um, and feel very lucky and pri privileged to be in the, the position I am now. Oh, well, uh, that's great. So tell us what position you are in now then. So I head up um, partnerships for a all-female motorsport series known as W Series. Um, prior to that, I joined W Series in 2019, so just over a year ago. And prior to that, I was working in uh, an all-electric motorsport series known as Formula E. So I've, I've, I've moved away from sustainability and environmental impact and into the world of diversity and inclusion which is naturally being um female i am i i can't help but be passionate about so um it's it's very exciting times it's a a new property we've we've only been around for for just um over 18 months two years um and and we're two seasons down and very much looking forward to 2021 so um yes i i have an exciting uh, an exciting work life is this is this what so I, I did hear them talk because I'm an F1 fan myself and and I'm becoming an, a, a, um, a Formula E fan as well now because I've interviewed Mark Preston and obviously as you know I know Spencer so I'm getting drawn into Formula E too. Um, yeah. But I, I, I vaguely remember hearing David Coulthard talking about W Series. Am I am I dreaming or is that is that right? Yeah, so so um, number one, I, I know Mark Preston very well. I used to work mm -hmm. um, alongside Mark Preston at, at DS Tutor in Formula E. Um, so so he's a very busy man as well at the moment, um, and and very much enjoyed my time there. Um, David Coulthard is is of course um, a huge ambassador of, of W Series, and is actually. Um, uh, an advisory board member for for W Series, so he is um, is very good friends with with um, our chairman Sean Wadsworth and our CEO Catherine Bonmuir, um, and and together they decided to to launch W Series um, in in 2018, running the first season in 2019. So um, we're very much in our infancy, um, but of course as a a mission-led brand and and something new and and disruptive. It's it's a very exciting place to be in. Um, 
and you know it's it's all about looking to to the future and how we grow and and widen participation for women in motorsport it's something that um you think is shall we say well overdue or is oh. that an unfair statement <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, it exists for that reason, obviously. Um, it's a huge, a huge issue in, in motorsports, as, as with many other sectors. You know, recently we've, we've delved into the esports world and gaming world, and, and really they face the same um, issues with regards, to, um, with, with regards to the number of women or females involved in, in gaming, in um, sim racing. And, you know, in motorsport. And so, you know, W Series is really, it exists because it wants to tackle, um, you know, the, the clear um, issues that, that exist currently with, with the lack of females that are competing in motorsport and at the highest levels. And the unique thing about motorsport, unlike other sporting properties, is that there is absolutely no reason why um, men and women cannot compete in the same arena. You know, obviously, unlike some of the more physical sports, um, such as football and rugby, there's there's clear reasons as to why they can't compete together. Um, but, you know, motorsport isn't just obviously about physical performance. That's, that is a big part of it. But it's, it's you know, there, there's a, a huge amount of technical um, development and technical understanding that's involved. Um, the drivers do a significant amount of sim development. Um, it's it's about reflexes. It's about risk management, um, and there really is no reason why why females cannot compete against um, males. So that's that's yeah, what makes yeah. it unique. That I think that's absolutely fascinating, and it it also adds another level of arguably and you can shoot me down on this of course but arguably it adds another level of excitement and fun because if you've got males and females in the race you know it's a bit like when you're at work or you're at school and it's the boys versus the girls and there's this kind of uh, rivalry that goes on between we've got to beat the girls we've got to beat the boys um you see even I i'm a celebrity get me out of here for example as well uh, in terms of the show that's on at the moment so i do think it adds another level of entertainment and enjoyment especially if the girls are beating the boys <laughs> yes yeah of course of course and and you know going back to to why i'm passionate about it um obviously as a female I would be passionate about it. And it's it's really about, it's not just, you know, having, um, you know, being in this fortunate position, having this, you know, being part of W Series is actually about helping, um, you know, more young girls, um, young females from around the world see motorsport as a potential career path. And it's not just about being a driver, you know, it, we, we're, we're looking, we run, um, uh, many grassroots projects and community outreach programs that we're looking to to roll out into 2021 that looks at the the whole supply chain the whole ecosystem so from engineering to mechanics to team principals to marketing to communications to truck drivers and um, you know just to just widen participation yeah. across the board across across the paddock and you know um being able to race with with formula one next year is obviously um really exciting for w series it's a huge marketing global marketing platform and um and you know w series are excited to to have the opportunity to be able to partner with them so um that's that's an important part of our roadmap moving forward but And a very warm welcome to Passions. And uh, in this episode, I'm delighted to be welcoming Keith Smout to the interview. So I guess we'll start at the, at the beginning, the most obvious place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what exactly is your passion and what is it that you do? 
Okay, well, my, my passion is kind of a long-term thing. I've been involved in motorsport as a career probably for the last 25 years now. Uh, it took me through Formula One um, times in Le Mans, and now I spend a lot of time, obviously, the last six seasons. I've been with Formula E since it started, the all-electric racing series, open-wheel series. Um, so, in general, my passion is motorsport. Um, I come about it fairly naturally, to be honest with you. My parents, uh, my mom from Sutton Cofield originally, and my dad from Shrewsbury, or Shrewsbury, depending on who you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, moved to Canada in the 50s. Um, my sisters were born in, in England, and my brother and I are first-generation uh, Canadians so from the family. So a very strong British heritage. And when I was a young boy, my parents made sure that I was uh, well-educated uh, in all things motorsport. Uh, taking me to Mossport, where they held the Canadian Grand Prix, a track that still exists. Uh, the first movie I ever went to, which in Canada, you know, very popular, the drive-in theaters was uh, in 1970, uh, which was uh, Le Mans with Steve McQueen. And I think uh, it's kind of been inbred into my soul ever since then and my mind. So, yeah, it come, like I said, it comes to me naturally. Let's have a chat about Formula E. Sure. Um, just, just first of all, tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is within Formula E and, and, no and your focus. Yeah, so I've been in the sport is going into season seven. I've been there since uh, month two of the sport. Uh, I'm the chief commercial officer for DS to Cheetah. We're the three-time driver champions and two-time team champions uh, the last three years. Um, I, my role is uh, quite varied. Um, I would say I'm the business side of the team. Um, my job is to uh, acquire the money, the sponsorship, the business deals, um, you know, retain all the new partners we have, create the marketing platform, you know, make sure the team looks right, deal with the hospitality, deal with team kit. There isn't a business function that I don't do. And because the only way to support the technical side of our team is to ensure that we are well-funded, well-positioned and marketed. And in a way, with our parent company being a Chinese company who hadn't, is very sports oriented, but not motorsport oriented. It's been a long process of education. They're incredibly mm -hmm. smart people, but you know, you have to educate them about what the sport is and how the business works because i think that motorsport is incredibly unique in the way that it works and you're always driven to need uh, an extreme amount of funding funding even though formula e is much more uh, cost productive and cost realistic compared to um, formula one uh, it's still a large sum of money to operate a team that travels internationally the big thing for me was, and I'll be completely honest, as I said to you, I own Jaguars that, you know, are noisy and loud. I don't drive them very much, but, you know, I do drive them. Um, and even myself, I, I had moved from Formula One, and I, when I came back to Canada, I wanted my daughter to be educated and grow up here. I worked in the music industry for four years, and, and then Mark was, do you want to come and look at Formula E? I was quite skeptical myself you know, the lack of sound and, and all these things that people talk about. But I have to say I converted very quickly. And in my racing career, I've enjoyed it more than any um, thing I've done. And I, not only from a, a spectator and competitive perspective, do I find it more exciting um, and very different because the strategy is incredibly different compared Hello and a very warm welcome to this episode of Passions and I truly am actually honoured today to be joined by Formula E Jaguar racing driver, none other than Sam Bird. So Sam, very, very warm welcome to Passions, really appreciate your time. So tell us who you are and what you're passionate about. So hey guys, my name is Sam Bird, I drive the number 10 car for Jaguar Racing in the FIA ABB Formula E series, which is in its seventh season. Um, what am I passionate about? Gosh, um, a lot of things. Obviously, clearly I've been passionate about motorsport now for a huge period of my life. It's been a, a huge part of me since, to be honest, since I was a little kid. 
So clearly I'm passionate about motorsport. I love other sports though. I love watching football. I played football at a decent level. Um, I enjoy my golf. Um, to be honest, I'm passionate about sport full stop. Formula E has made me passionate about looking after the environment, um, caring for the planet that we, that we live on. And yeah, passionate about my family and friends um, as well. I guess a good place to start would be a lot of, probably a lot of kids have uh, an aspiration or a, I'm going to use the word dream, maybe okay. to be a racing driver. It's, it's in a way, it's kind of in that area of astronaut or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. What it's... do you think it was about you and your approach that may, got you to where you are now, as opposed to one of the wannabes, if you like? Um, I think, look, I think growing up, and certainly in the early days of my karting, because you start in karting, um, I wasn't necessarily the quickest guy because I didn't have the financial backing from mum and dad because they didn't have it to go out all the time in a go-kart like some of the other kids were three, four days a week um, after school, getting to the track, doing some laps. I'd do it just on the race weekends whenever they, whenever they were. Um, but... I had, uh, you know, with, with this passion that I've got, I had a drive and an energy that has got me to where I am today. I, I you know, this never give up attitude. And, you know, I, I've had this dream since a kid and I've run with it and gone with it and not let the, the haters get me down. Um, almost kind of used some people's negative energy and turned it into positive energy for me to kind of show, look, I, I can do this. I want to do this for me. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've progressed with my skill set and, and it's got me to where I am, where I am today. So Fantastic. if you have a dream, guys, go for it and go for it. No holds barred, because especially when you're a kid, um, a lot of people give up their dreams a bit early and they go into, uh, you know, a, a different form of job. And especially as a sportsman, the last thing you want to do is wake up every day for the rest of your life thinking, what if I'd gone that extra mile? Could I have been in their shoes or their shoes when looking up at the TV and watching your favorite athlete in your favorite sport? Go for it. At least try. Try your best to try and succeed. And if it doesn't happen for you, at least you can hold your hands up at the end of the day and say, you know what? I've given it everything. I gave it my all. It just wasn't to be. But at least you can live with that then. I think that it's far more disappointing for people when they don't give it their all and then think, what if? And I don't think you should have what ifs in life.